Hello everybody. Okay, in today's session we are looking at what is memory? So a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that memory is how much storage you've got in your computer and that is not what memory is. Do not make the mistake of saying that memory is the same thing as your secondary storage device like your hard drive. That is not what memory is. Main memory is your RAM. So it's where programs and data are stored while they're being used. So as we know, we've got our CPU works very closely with the RAM and it will fetch instructions from the open programs that are currently stored in RAM. Now, if I've got software on my computer like PowerPoint, it's actually stored long term in my secondary storage device, such as a hard drive or a solid state drive. But because your secondary storage device is relatively slow, when it's in use, it does get copied into RAM. Now, the reason for that is because RAM is so much faster than your secondary storage device. Now, because it was only copied there temporarily, if the computer was to be turned off, your main memory would forget what was currently stored in it. The word for that when it's forgotten is volatile. Now let's have a look at another type of memory. So the next one is read-only memory or ROM. Now you've probably heard the terminology read-only before and it's usually on when you open like a Word document on Teams or something like that. And sometimes it's on there as read-only and it quite literally means that you can only read from it, you can't write to it at all. Now the reason for that is because it contains some very important information in there which are the instructions that your computer needs to boot up, which is your BIOS. If you were to accidentally overwrite that information, then your computer might not be able to boot up again. Now, if I turn off my computer, unlike RAM, which forgets everything when you turn it off, your ROM will remember it all because it is non-volatile. So everything's still there even after the computer is switched off. So let's look at our final type of memory. We've got something called virtual memory. Now, virtual memory is not necessarily a good thing. It's when your secondary storage gets used as extra RAM. What that means is your RAM or your main memory is full. It means you've filled it to capacity. And when it's full, that's when your secondary storage device steps in and says, right, I will act as RAM so that you can free up a little bit of space. So whichever piece of software that you've currently got open that you've not used for a while will be the one which gets moved into your secondary storage device as virtual memory. Well, as you know, the CPU fetches the instructions from RAM. So what has to happen is the, the software which is currently in virtual memory has to be moved back to RAM before it can be read by the CPU. Now this process is really slow, which is why virtual memory is not necessarily a good thing. Okay, so to finish with, we've got some exam questions on our memory topic. So what is the purpose of main memory in a computer? We've got to explain why Mr. Moore might need more RAM in his computer. What is meant by virtual memory? And finally, is ROM volatile or non-volatile? Explain your answer. So as always, I would recommend not checking back in your notes if you can. Try and answer these from your recall and then checking to see if you got them right afterwards. And if you didn't, don't worry about it. You can just keep attempting those questions until they are firmly lodged into your long-term memory. Hello, everybody. This session, we are doing what is a secondary storage device. I wanna just talk about one of the most common mistakes that people make when it comes to that word secondary. When people see the word secondary, they assume that it means that it's a backup from the original storage. So it's not the first storage device, it's the second storage device. Now that is a load of rubbish. That is not true. Do not make that mistake. So your secondary storage is your long-term storage. If you're gonna describe it, if you were asked to find or explain what is meant by the term secondary storage, it'll be a two mark answer. And these are the two things that you need to say that it's long-term storage, and you could say even after the device is switched off, but then there's that other word in there, non-volatile, which is what that means. So the, the, the files are gonna be there even after the device is switched off. Okay, so here's the kind of things that you can store with your secondary storage device. So general files, like your, your Word documents, your PowerPoints and things like that. Uh, audio files, 
Most common, you'd probably store MP3 files, video files like an MP4, images like a PNG or a JPEG, that kind of thing, and your programs, which is something that people often forget, will also also be stored in here. All right, so when we talk about storage, uh, they like to ask about the different types of storage, sometimes which one's the most suitable for a situation. So these are the three main types of storage. We've got optical, we've got magnetic, and solid state. So let's have a little look at optical storage first. So if we've got some examples, so you can picture it a little bit easier. So a CD is an optical storage device a DVD. When you're asked questions about why you would choose optical storage, you need to be able to justify why you think optical storage is better than another type of storage, or maybe worse than another type of storage, depending on whether you need to argue for or against. So to do that, we need to know about the characteristics. So let's have a look at the good characteristics of optical storage first. So it's really cheap. So if you're going to buy a, a CD, for example, it's really cheap. So if you needed something uh, very uh, quick to put something on and you, it's probably disposable, you're not going to use it again. It's good that it's not going to cost you a lot of money for that reason. Also, it's portable. There was an exam question a long time ago now, and it was talking about which storage device would be the most suitable to go on the front of a magazine. And the answer was, it was optical storage. And that was because it's portable, it's flat, and uh, it's cheap as well. So those are some of the reasons why you would choose optical storage. But let's have a look at some of the bad characteristics of optical storage. So it's got a slow write speed, and what that means is if you were going to put files on there, it does take quite a while. It's not durable, so they scratch really easy, which can be an issue. It can't be read anymore by the laser, and then it's not going to work anymore. And they have relatively low storage. Even the Blu-ray disc, which out of those three has got the most storage, it's still pretty low storage compared to other storage mediums. Next, we're going to look at magnetic storage. So let's do some examples first. So most common one is the hard drive, which is probably the one that most people have heard of. Most computers do come with a hard drive and we'll talk about characteristics why in a moment. Um, not as common, we've got the tape drive and definitely not as common, we've got the floppy disk. So let's have a look at the characteristics of magnetic storage. So first of all, what's good about them buy a hard drive really cheap nowadays it wouldn't cost you much money to have a really high amount of storage for not that much money they're pretty durable as well usually people use internal hard drives which means that they don't get moved around much which means that they're very unlikely to break from being banged or something like that and as previously mentioned they've got really high storage capacities as well so let's have a look at some of the bad characteristics of magnetic storage. So it's got a really slow write speed, it's still slow. It's marginally faster than optical storage write speeds, but it's still not quick enough to use it as, a, as an advantage. And it's not portable majority of the time. I mentioned earlier an internal hard drive. You can buy external hard drives, which are plugged in via USB, but majority of hard drives are internal. I know it talks mainly about the, the hard drive here uh, because that's the most common magnetic storage device. So when you're thinking of magnetic, try and think hard drive. It's unlikely you're going to be asked for more than one example of magnetic storage device. But just in case you are, we've got these other ones, the tape drive and the floppy disk. And finally, we've got solid state storage. So let's have a look at some examples first. So we've got USB drives. Don't fall into the trap of just saying USB. That will not get you the mark on its own. It's got to be USB drive. SD cards, like they go in, the, in a camera. Micro SD cards, if you're maybe upgrading the memory in your phone or your Nintendo Switch. And nice and easy to remember, because it's almost exactly the same as the title, the solid state drive. So let's have a look at some of the characteristics of solid state storage. So 
this is going to be the the best overall storage device that you can choose. So it's got some really good characteristics. It's portable. It's durable. So if you dropped it, it's unlikely to break. It's got very high storage capacity and it's got a really fast write speed. And that's due to having no moving parts inside. So really fast write speed. So that's probably its biggest advantage. But it does have only one bad characteristic, which is it is very expensive. It's very expensive because it's so good. Okay, so here are some questions for you to practice. I'd recommend giving them a go. Try and answer them without looking back on the video or looking back into your notes. There's plenty of questions here that you can have a little go at. I just wanted to point out that at the bottom, we've got a six mark answer, which was a previous question on an exam where you had to describe the characteristics between magnetic and solid state storage devices. And for a six marker, you had to come up with the different characteristics and why one would be better in a certain situation. So it was quite an ask really, but it would be a really good practice for your extended writing if you can give that one a go as well. That's it for the- Hello everybody. Okay, in this session, we are gonna be looking at how to convert between file sizes. So to understand this a little bit better, we do need to find out what is binary. Now, this is a term that a lot of us have probably heard about binary before, but we do need to recap it just so that we've got a good understanding of what our most basic file size actually starts at, and then we can build from there so that we've got a good understanding of why and how we're going to be converting between these file sizes. So in terms of a definition about what binary actually is, which has been a question on previous papers, Computers use ones and zeros to represent the flow of electricity, which is probably not the definition which you're expecting for what binary is. A lot of people will put something like the language the computer understands and things like that, which isn't necessarily wrong. But in terms of an accurate definition, this is what binary actually is. All data is converted to binary so that it can be processed. Like we've just kind of mentioned, the computer does only understand binary so that's why it has to be converted into binary or machine code as it's sometimes referred to so that the computer can then process that information and figure out what the instructions actually are. Here's the key bit that we needed to know. The smallest unit of measurement is what we call a bit or a single one or a zero. Now when it comes to file sizes, the bit is the smallest file size possible that we need to know about in our exam. When we hear the word file size, what does that actually mean? So it's the amount of actual storage that a file will take up on a secondary storage device. So if I was gonna store a picture onto my hard drive, for example, it's how much space that it's gonna take up in the hard drive or how much storage it's actually gonna use. Now these are the different file sizes that we need to know about for the exam. So a bit is our very beginning. It's the smallest file size that we need. And if we've got four bits, we can refer to that as a nibble. Eight bits is one byte. Now this is where we come to what I usually refer to as the magic number, 1024. Now you are allowed to use a rounded version of that where you round it down to a thousand and that's much easier to deal with and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So a thousand bytes or 1024 bytes to be precise is one kilobyte. 1024 kilobytes is one megabyte. 1,024 megabytes is one gigabyte. 1,024 gigabytes is one terabyte. And finally, 1,024 terabytes is one petabyte. So that you can see what is why I call it the magic number because look how many times that number comes up. As long as you can remember 1,000 or 1,024, that makes our job so much easier when it comes to doing the actual conversions themselves. Now there are known file sizes that are bigger than this and smaller. However, this these are the ones that we need to be able to convert between for our exam. In the exam, unfortunately, it's non-calculator and they do phrase some of the questions in some ways, which makes it a little bit tricky to figure out what it is that it's asking of us. So we're gonna have a little look at a few ways that we can approach these kinds of questions. So here's an example one. How many megabytes are there in one terabytes. Now I've purposely done this because a lot of people would think, oh, well, it'll just be something easy. Like how many gigabytes are in one terabyte? And we'd just say a thousand, 
But notice that I've not gone for that. I've gone for megabytes. Where So gigabytes is in between the megabytes and the terabyte here. So to do that, we know that there's a thousand megabytes in one gigabyte. So all we had to do there was multiply it by a thousand. So one times a thousand, that gives us one gigabyte. Notice that I didn't use the 1024 here. I've just gone for a thousand because it's much easier to deal with and it's accepted on the mark scheme to use the rounded number. But because we're now at gigabytes, we then need to multiply that again by a thousand because that's how we're gonna to get to one terabyte. So in other words, there are one million megabytes in one terabyte. Now, as you can see by looking at that, the easiest way of doing that would just be to add the zeros onto the end of the one because we've got six zeros there, which gives us one million megabytes. But you can do one times a thousand times a thousand. That will also give us our correct answer, which is one million megabytes in one terabyte. Let's have a look at another one. So Mr. Moore has a two terabyte hard drive, an image, is one megabyte. How many images can Mr. Moore store on his hard drive? So this is almost the exact same question that we've just had. However, look how differently it's been worded. And you would just need to not overthink it and just think, well, I need to know how many megabytes are in one terabyte. And once we have our answer, we can just multiply it by two because it's two terabytes. So again, one megabyte times a thousand, that gets us to one gigabyte. We then multiply that by a thousand, which gives us one terabyte. And finally, we know that there's a million images in one terabyte, so we can just times that by two. So the answer would be two million images in two terabytes, if they were all exactly one megabyte. That's a lot of images. Okay, so to finish, I've got some more exam questions for you to practice, very similar to the ones that we've just done, but ones that we've definitely seen in the past on previous papers. So how many bits are in a byte? How many kilobytes are in one gigabyte? And finally, similar to one on our previous slide, Mr. Moore has an image that is two megabytes. How many copies of the image could Mr. Moore fit in a two gigabyte hard drive. So I'd recommend pausing the video there, give these questions a go, try not look back at your notes. And then obviously if you're struggling a little bit, maybe rewind the video, give another watch and let me know how you get on. Hello okay, that everybody. So in this session, we are gonna be learning how to convert between deanery and binary. And the first thing we need to know is what number system we use. Now it can be referred to a few different things. You've got denary or deanery, as some people say. You've got decimal or base 10. Now, the reason it gets called base 10 is probably the most accurate name for it. And that's because we use 10 different values in our number system. So we've got from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Now, the binary number system can be referred to as base two, and that's because it's only got two different values that it can possibly be, which is a one or a zero. Now, for the sake of your exam, you only need to be able to do up to one byte of information, which our maximum binary number that we are gonna be able to make with that uh, will be the deanery 255. Now, you're gonna to wanna to always draw this table out in your exam because it will help you with your conversions. So if you ever see a binary conversion, there's lots of space on your paper, just draw this table out. You've got note pages at the back. You just wanna use the time, you've got plenty of time. Don't try and just do it in your head. Just make sure you do the conversion to double check your answer. And this is what it looks like. Now, if you're no good with powers of two, which all of these are, you can just start at the right hand side with the number one and you can keep on doubling it until you get to 128. So we're gonna start with one, we double it to get two, we double it to get four, eight, 16, 32, 64, one, two, eight. So here's how we would write the number one in binary. And as you can see, I've written it as a byte. I've got seven zeros and then my final one I've put a one there because I needed that top value from the headings in that table to represent what a one looks like in binary. Now let's try it with the value two. So I've got zero, 
for the first six this time, but then I've got a one where the two is because that's what number I'm trying to make now. I didn't need the one value at the end, so I've got a zero there now. So we're going up one at a time. So here's how we'd write three out in binary because I've got a one in both the one column and the two column. That means that I've written out the binary for the deanery three. Let's look at a couple more examples. So if this was an exam question, convert the deanery 88 into binary. So again, we're going to start by writing out our conversion table. So what we need to look at is which of these numbers do we need to add up to make 88? Now we know that 128 is too big. Okay, that one, it's, it's over the value 88, so we don't need that one. However, we do want 64. That's the highest number that can fit into 88. So we need to try and make another 24 out of what we've got left. So 32 is too high. But if I had 16, that's going to bring me to 80. So we're really close now. Okay, so we're currently at 80. Now, if I add another 8, we have made it. Okay, that's all we would need to make the number 88. However, we've not given our answer in a byte yet. So we would need to finish this off and we would put a zero in the remaining columns there. We're gonna look at another one which is a little bit trickier, but it's only tricky because it's quite a, a relatively high number and you're not allowed to use a calculator in your exam, unfortunately. So you do need to be able to do this addition yourself. Now, don't forget, you can use your note pages to do any addition in any way you want. It's usually a two mark answer when you do a conversion like this. And each mark makes a massive difference in computer science. So don't make any mistakes with your adding up. Now, the first trick that we're going to go for is that these two, 128 add 64, these two add up to 192. So if you can remember that, you are going to save yourself quite a lot of your battle straight away because you're dealing with quite big numbers here. And the tricky bit is where people are going to try and add numbers to go over the 200 mark. But that just comes with practice that the more of these that you do in your head, you will get much faster at doing these. So at that point, we know we need to use both of these because we are trying to make 209 and we're currently at 192. If I added 32 to that, we'd be way over. So we're not going to need that one. However, if I add 16 to that one, that's going to bring us to 208, which puts me really close to our answer. So all I need to do now is find another one. So we can put a zero for all of these here. And finally, we need a one and we've made 209. Now, what happens if we get it the other way around and they give you the binary number and they say convert this into a deanery number? Now, if anything, this is actually easier because all you've got to do is write out that binary number into your conversion table. So we're going to do it just underneath. So 1011010101. Zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, like this. Okay. And again, this comes into your practice of adding everything up where there's a 1. So 128 add 32 is going to give us 160. We're going to add 16 to that, which gives us 176. We're going to add 4 to that, which gives us 180. So this is the binary for the deanery, 180. Okay, so to finish with, we've got some questions just to practice your conversions, which are relatively straightforward. So our first one, convert the deanery 45 into binary. Second question is convert the deanery 112 into binary. Question three, convert the deanery 231 into binary. And then I've got three binary conversions as well left for you. So be sure to use your binary conversion table. And hello, everybody. So carrying on from our last session where we converted into binary, we are now going to learn how to add binary values together. So just as a little warm up, let's first of all do a couple of conversions and then we're going to use our method to add them together. So we're going to start by doing the conversion for 98. Now, we don't need 128 because that is too high, but we do need 64 and 32 because that's going to bring us to 96. So we're actually really close at this point. All we're going to need is our 2, and that gives us 98. So that was a relatively straightforward one. So now we need our 142. So we know that we can squeeze in 128, 
But 64, 32 and 16 are going to put us over 142. So we don't need those. So the first thing that we're going to add on to that is 8, which brings us to 136. If I add another 4 to that, that's going to bring us to 140. We're really close now. We're just going to add another 2, which gets us our answer. We don't need this final value, so we're just going to put that as a 0. So at this point, we've got two binary values and we are going to learn how to add these two together. So I'm just going to put a little line underneath that. So the method here is if we have a zero and a zero, we add those together, it's going to give us zero. Zero add one is going to give us one. One add zero is going to give us one. One add one is going to give us a zero. Carry one. 1 add 1 add 1 is going to give us a 1 carry 1. Now the problem comes in when we've got an answer of 2 and that's because you can't write the number 2 in binary. So if I was to look at this point here, we've got a 1 add a 1. Now that's not going to work for us So because if I was going to write a 2 in binary, we would need to write it as 1 0 like this. This is why I've written down there that it's zero carry one because we've got the zero here and we're going to carry this one. And in a similar way, again, if we've got one add one and we're going to carry one, that's because, we, again, we can't write the number three in binary, but we can put a one here and here to make the number three. So that's why we're going to put the one as our answer and then we're going to carry this one. Okay, so let's carry out the addition and we'll use those rules on the side and hopefully it'll become a little bit more obvious as to what's going on here. So we're going to add 0 and 0. This is going to give us a 0. 1 add 1. We know that we can't represent that by writing 2. So we're going to put 0 and we're going to carry 1. 1 add 1 is going to give us 0. Carry 1. 1 Add 1 is going to be a 0, carry 1. 0 add 1 is going to give us 1. 1 add 0 is going to give us 1. 1 add 0 is going to give us 1. And then finally, 0 add 1 is going to give us 1. So this is how we add two binary values together. There's no requirement to then convert that into DNA by adding up all these values uh, across the top. We don't need to do that. It will usually tell you how to express your answer and it will usually just say to add them together, which is fine to leave it as a byte in binary. Similar to our last session, you will get one mark for each nibble that you get correct. So if I just draw a line down the middle of that, you would get one mark for getting this side of it right. You would get another mark for getting this side of it right. Okay, so I'm going to add these together now and... Let's see what happens. So one add zero is gonna give us one. Zero add one is gonna give us one. Zero add zero is gonna give us zero. One add zero is gonna give us one. Zero add one is gonna give us one. One add one is gonna give us zero, carry one. Zero add one is gonna give us one. But one add one is going to give us a zero, but then it should be a carry one. Now I'm just going to park this carried one over here for now. But I just want to read this question again. It says, give your answer as a byte. Now we know that eight bits are in a byte. So this is all you would need to write down on your exam. If you wrote down this extra digit here, you could lose a mark for that because it specifically says give your answer as a byte. So don't fall into that trap. It's not incorrect by having an extra value carried at the end. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But if it specifically says give your answer as a byte, just keep in mind that a byte is 8 bits. So you need to keep your answer at 8 bits. So at that point there, you would make sure that you didn't have this written on your paper, you just kept it like that as your answer. But it does bring us to an important point that we did have an extra value carried over at the end. 
Now this gets a special name, which is an overflow error, and we're gonna talk about it now. So exactly as we've just done then, when you're adding binary results together, you could get more bits than the CPU was expecting, and that's what's known as an overflow error. You might get a question in your exam asking what is meant by an overflow error. This was this is the kind of answer that you could give, that it's more bits than the CPU is expecting, but as a little bit more detail that you can give there, you can say that it could cause software to crash if it can't deal with that extra bit. So often software is written pretty well and it can handle those extra bits and it knows that it's going to store them somewhere else and that will prevent the software from crashing. Okay, so to finish with today, I've got some exam questions to practice. So I've got three sets of bytes here that you can add together separately. I would recommend doing it on a scrap piece of paper. You can get your conversion chart out if that helps as well. Now I've not specified here if you need to give your answer as a byte or not. So if it's gonna give you an overflow error, then go with it, that's fine. You write that overflow error down as a ninth bit. And that's it. Hello everybody. We are gonna be looking at how to perform a binary shift. This is a typical question that you might get in your exam. Perform a two place binary shift to the left. And as you can see what we've got there, we've got an eight bit number there. Now, hopefully you know your left from your right. That will obviously make a difference. We have been asked to shift to the left by two places. Okay, we know our left from our right and we can count to two. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna draw uh, an arrow from each of them just so that you can really make sure you've got this correct. So I'm gonna draw that one. It's gonna go two places to the left like that. Okay, so that one is gonna be a one at this position because we've gone from this position here. We've gone two to the left, which has brought us here. So that one has moved over here, all right? And this one is also gonna move to, everything is gonna move two to the left. So if we just draw this out, so we've got one, one, zero, zero. And then we've got one, zero. Now, unfortunately, these two have fell off the end. Okay, they, they have gone too far. We want to keep this as an 8-bit binary number. So those two have gone, disappeared. But that only leaves us with 6 bits filled in and we've not done anything with the side on the right. So what we're going to do is just fill it with zeros. And that's it. It is as simple as that. So you move exactly the number that it says, two places we went in the left direction and we filled it with zeros. Now let's look at the exact same question, but this time instead of shifting to the left, we are gonna shift to the right. This time I'm gonna start at the other side and these ones are gonna go two places to the right like this. Okay, all of them are gonna just go two places to the right. So I will do this one is moving over here. So I'm gonna put my one just there. Let's carry on writing it out. So we've got another one, zero, one, zero, and zero. Okay, so everything has been moved to the right. However, this one and this one fell off the end. They don't exist anymore, they've gone. So at that point, We've got a gap over on the left hand side because this time we shifted to the right. So we are gonna fill it with zeros. Now it is only gonna be a one mark question on your exam this if you get a binary shift. However, they can ask you to describe the effect that it has and that's what we're gonna have a look at now. So for the first example that we looked at, we shifted everything to the left. Now it has a different effect on the actual binary number by shifting to the left. And that effect is it multiplies the number. So if you were to shift it one place to the left, that actually multiplies the number by two. And if you were gonna shift it two places to the left, that is gonna multiply it by four. And finally, if you were gonna shift it three places to the left, that will multiply the number by eight. Now you won't be asked 
for any more than that in your exam. They may ask you that it ha what effect does it have making a binary shift to the left by three places? And that's a two mark answer if you have if you've been asked to describe that. But I d it's very very unlikely it's going to go in higher than that. But it does carry on with that path. So if it did shift four places to the left, it would multiply it by sixteen. You can also divide in binary by using the binary shift. And it just quite simply is going the opposite way. So it's multiply if it's going to the left and it's division if it's going to the right. So if you wanted to divide by two, you would do a one place shift to the right. If you wanted to divide by four, it's two places to the right. And finally, if you want to divide by eight, it is three places to the right. So we've got some exam questions to practice on the binary shift. As always, it's probably best if you pause the video and give it a go. And then if you need to go watch back just to double check your answer, then that's fine. But try and answer them all without looking at your notes in your book. And then obviously check afterwards to see if you got them correct. Hello, Hello everybody. In today's session, we are going to be looking at what is a character set. <laughs> Now you might be asked in your exam, explain what is meant by a character set. Now if it says the word explain, you should know by now that that is a command word and that is going to be a two mark answer if you're asked to explain something. So if you're asked explain what is meant by a character set, your answer is the characters that can be represented by a computer system. What does that actually mean? Now when I say a computer system, Obviously, we don't actually need to be using a computer or a laptop. We could be talking about just general devices like a smartphone. If you are going to be messaging someone on your smartphone, you are going to be using things like uppercase characters, lowercase characters, uh, numbers, symbols, and emoji, and so on. And all of those need to be stored inside your device. But as you know, the computer can only process binary information, machine code. So if you were to enter a letter on your keyboard, it has to be converted into binary so that it knows what it is that you've done so that it can then be displayed on the screen correctly. The computer does that using something known as the character set, characters that can be represented by your computer system. Now, a really common character set is ASCII. Now ASCII is a 7-bit character set, however, it does have a zero at the beginning of all ASCII characters, which is going to make it into an 8-bit character set. And each character is given a code, and that code is stored in binary, which takes up one byte, which as we know, one byte is 8 bits. So as we said earlier, if you were to press a key on your keyboard, that will send that signal to the computer telling it which key was pressed. And then the computer uses that character set to translate that binary code into that particular character. So at that point, it would be outputted on the screen and you get exactly what it is that you've asked for. So another character set that we need to be aware of is Unicode. And Unicode uses multiple bytes. So we were looking at ASCII earlier, that only used one byte of information, whereas Unicode uses multiple bytes. And because it's got multiple bytes of information, it can store millions of possible characters, which is obviously enough to cover all major languages, which is great if you want to change your keyboard on your device to a different language. And as we mentioned earlier, ASCII is actually a subset of Unicode. So the first 128 codes of Unicode are exactly the same as ASCII. In the latest exam, there was an unusual question which asked you to write down the binary for an ASCII character. So we need to be able to write out the ASCII character alphabet and it is really straightforward to remember as long as we follow these steps. So let's do an example. Write the binary for the ASCII character J. Now notice that this is a capital J and that makes a difference to how we're going to start our byte of information. If it's a capital letter like this one is, we're going to start our byte with 010. But if it was a lowercase j, you would start with 011 instead. Now, we do need to know our alphabet to do these questions. So it might be an idea, just so we don't make any mistakes, use your note pages at the back of your book. I would write out your alphabet if you were asked to do one of these in your exam. And then that way, there can be no mistakes. So J is the 10th letter of the alphabet. So we're going to write the binary for 10. So 
we're going to use our good old conversion table. At the beginning of it, you can see we've got our 0, 1, 0. So 0 in 128, 1 in 64, and 0 in 32. But then the rest of this binary number, you just needed to make the, the number 10 in binary, where we've got an 8 and we've got a 2. So this is J in ASCII. So let's do one more example. So if we were going to convert the character, the lowercase character P, for example, we would first need to count out how many letters in the letter P is. So A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. So it's the 16th letter in the alphabet. And we said we're going to do a lowercase letter. So the lowercase P is going to look like we're going to have a zero at the beginning. It's lowercase, so we want a one, one. And we need to make 16 for the letter P. So we're going to put a 1 there, which is 16, and the rest can be 0. And that is a lowercase p. So to finish, here's some exam questions that you can have a little practice of. So I want to know what is meant by a character set. How many bits is ASCII written in? I've got a couple of conversions, which is a capital letter Q, and then a lowercase t into ASCII binary. And then finally, a bit of practice based on the last video as well. Once you've converted it into binary, I want you to then convert it into hexadecimal. So as always, pause the video at this point, give the questions a go without rewinding back or checking in your notes, and then obviously check your answers afterwards. Just repetition is key to making sure that you are confident in these areas. Hello, everybody. In today's session, we are going to be looking at what is an image? So images are made up of tiny dots called pixels. There's thousands of dots in every single image. Every pixel is a different color. And to know what color to light up that pixel to, to actually create the image, it has to get a specific code, which is a binary code, so that it knows what color to become. The amount of colors actually depends on how many bits are available for each of the different pixels. So what I mean by that, if we think about our binary conversion chart where we, where we often use eight bits, if we were to use just one of those bits, there'd be two colors available if it was a one or a zero in that one position. And if we were to use four bits, so like a nibble, there are 16 different possible combinations. So like you've got zero, 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 one, 0010 0, and so on and there's, there's 16 different combinations that you can make there which means there'd be 16 different colors available with four bits 24 bits would be over 16 million colors available and to calculate that there is actually a way of calculating it so you can just do uh, 2 to the power of n where n is the number of bits per pixel so for example if we were just using our 8-bit conversion chart like we've done loads of times with our binary conversions we can do 2 to the power of 8, which gives us 256, which is a really quick way of working it out. The other way of working it out is if you had a 1 in every single position of our conversion chart and added it all up together, it would give you 255, but then there's the null value as well if they were all zeros, which means in total we've got 256 colors available with 8 bits. So that means that each bit could be one of those 256 colors. But if we then use 24 bits, because there's so many colors available, that means that the overall file size of the image is going to be much larger. What is image resolution? So image resolution is quite simply the number of pixels that are in an image. And you can, you can calculate it a bit like you would in maths uh, if you were calculating the area of a square. So you just do the width times the height. So if an image has more pixels, it will be much higher quality because there's more dots available in that picture. So there's more quality there. However, because there's more pixels, that means you're going to have to have more binary information stored about that image, which means that the, the overall file size is going to be much bigger. So there's two things so far that's affected the file size. The number of pixels that are available, which is the resolution, and the number of bits per pixel, which is the color depth. So all of those pixels can be a number of possible colors. So the higher those are, the higher the file size overall. Now, when it comes to storage on the computer, you can actually calculate how many bits the image is going to take up. 
and there's a little formula we can do for it. So first of all, we can do the width times the height, like we did to calculate the resolution and how many pixels are in the image. But then we can also multiply that by the color depth by how many bits are in each pixel. Let's say that one image uses three different colors. Now we know we need at least two bits to be able to create three different colors. So this image next to me has got 25 different pixels. So to calculate this resolution, I did five times by five. And then because the number of bits needed was two, I'm then gonna times that by two. So in total, that's gonna give us 50 bits to store the image. Now you may be asked to calculate uh, how many bits are in an image, but they may ask you to give your answer in something like bytes or kilobytes, depending on the size of the image. But in the question itself, it will give you all the information that you need to know to be able to do this. Just remember to multiply them all together. Okay, finally, we need to talk about something called metadata. It's been a question on past exams a couple of times, actually, explain what is meant by metadata. And it is one that throws people off. It's a two mark answer. So in terms of a definition, uh, metadata stores additional image information. So if you wrote that and then gave some examples of metadata, then you would get your two marks. Another thing that you can write about metadata when explaining is it helps the computer recreate the image on screen from the binary data in each pixel. So these are the examples. So with things like your file format, uh, the width, height, color depth, resolution. There's sometimes more than that as well. That's just a few of the examples, like GPS information will be on there as well. Okay, so that's it for your image representation topic. We've got some questions that we can practice. So question number one, state what is meant by the term resolution. Because it's a state question, it's often only a one mark answer that one. Describe how images are represented in binary. State what is meant by metadata. Give one example of metadata that could be stored alongside an image. Explain how reducing the number of colors in an image can reduce its file size. And finally, calculate how many bits an image uses with a resolution of 15 by nine, which uses 16 colors. So as always, give these questions a go before you check back in your notes or anything like that. And then obviously, if you're not sure, then go back, watch the video again and check your notes again. That repetition is what's going to get you really confident in answering these questions in your exam. Hello everybody! In this session we are going to be looking at how is sound stored? So if we were going to be recording a sound, we would use a microphone, a bit like this one. Now this is an analog signal, however, if it was going to be stored onto a computer, it has to be converted into digital data. It's called an analog to digital converter. But how is sound converted? So we take what's known as samples of the amplitude of the wave at regular intervals. You can only take amplitude based on values in a certain bit depth. If you think back to our last lesson on image representation, so if we think about each of the pixels could only be a certain number of colors based on how many bits we're in each pixel. Well, this is the same kind of thing, but for sound. So the more bits that are available, the more possible sounds that it can be. And that's what's known as bit depth. Okay, so in terms of what we need to know and think about in our answer, we need to think about what affects the size and the quality overall. So sample frequency is how many samples are taken in one second. We mentioned earlier, sometimes it we called sampling, but sample frequency is probably the more common name for it. Now, a really common sample frequency is 44,100 samples every second, but it is measured in hertz, which is the same as saying 44.1 kilohertz. And as we said before, the bit depth is the number of bits available for each of those samples. So if you think every second there's 44,100 samples, and if there's more possible sounds available, then it's gonna increase the file size significantly. But because you've got more possible sounds, it will be closer to the original sound, which means it's going to be higher quality overall. Now we can calculate the size of a sound just by the information that we know about it. So we've got our sample frequency, which is how many samples it is per second, which is measured in Hertz. That's going to be multiplied by the bit depth. And then finally, you will multiply that by how many seconds the sound is. So if you had 20 seconds of audio, 
with a bit depth of eight bits and a sample rate of a thousand, then all you need to do is multiply it all together. So 20 times by eight times by a thousand, which will give you 160,000 bits or 160 bytes. So if you're trying to think about what you need to include in your answer, it can be quite difficult to remember it. So I've got a stupid but easy way to remember it. So these are the two things that we know already that we need to include in our answer. We've got bit depth and the sample frequency because they're the two things that will affect the overall quality and the file size itself. So your way of remembering is blue ducks sound funny. So you've got BD, blue ducks, which is bit depth, and then sound funny, sample frequency, which is the SF part of it. So if we can remember blue ducks sound funny, we need to think that we need to include bit depth and sample frequency in our answer because they are the two things that affect the file size and the quality. If you were asked a question such as explain what affects the overall file size of a sound file, you could give an answer something like, the more samples per second will give a more accurate sound to the original, and that's the sample frequency. And to expand on that, you can put the bit depth will affect how many possible sounds can be stored digitally. And overall, increasing the sample frequency or bit depth will improve the quality, but will also increase the file size. The bottom point that I've made there, increasing the sample frequency or bit depth will improve the quality but increase the file size. That's enough to get you a two mark answer. However, for a more detailed answer, if it was like a three or four marker, you would have to include the other points as well. So to finish with, we've got some example questions that you can practice. We've got describe how sampling is used when storing sound. Explain the effects of the sampling frequency on the size and the quality of the sound file recorded. State what is meant by the sound bit depth. And finally, calculate how many bits would be in a sound that has 30 seconds of audio with a bit depth of 8 bits and a sample rate of 500 hertz. Show your working. As always, give these a go before checking back in your notes or back on this video and see how you do. And obviously, give it another go if you didn't quite get it the first time. Hello, everybody. In this session, we are going to be looking at what is compression. So I always think it's quite easy to remember what compression is because we can think of it like crushing a can. So if you've had a can of Coke, something like that, finish with your can, you will often, with shoes, crush that can and then you will recycle it. But when you crush it down, you've still got the whole can there, but you've made it smaller so it takes up less space. And that is what compression is. But there's different forms of compression, so we need to talk about that. So in terms of a definition, you're reducing the file size, but you're trying to keep the file as true to the original as possible. Now there's different reasons why you would compress a file. The main one is just so it takes up less space on your secondary storage device. So let's say you've got a hard drive in your computer and you want to store as many files as possible on there. So the files are going to be compressed so that you can store the maximum amount possible. In addition to that, if you're going to download something from the internet, it's going to be much faster. If it takes up less storage, then the file itself will download faster. So I'm not sure how many of you have tried to attach files to an email. There's actually a maximum of 25 megabytes that you can attach to an email. If you have got smaller files, you'll be able to fit more files onto the email as an attachment. And finally, if you're on the internet using a browser, the web pages themselves will actually load quicker if they've got smaller file sizes and less information to pull down. So I mentioned earlier, we've got two different types of compression. Now your two different types are lossy and lossless compression. Let's have a look at lossy compression first. Now if you've got a file such as a JPEG, which is an image file, lossy compression will actually reduce the number of colors available in that image. So it'll reduce the amount of bits needed per pixel. That's the color depth that we were talking about in our image representation video. So less bits available per pixel means that there will be less colors available per pixel. But because there's now less colors available, it means that the image itself won't look as clear because the colors aren't gonna be 
as accurate to the original actual color. But because there's less binary information per pixel, it is gonna reduce the overall file size. The other thing that happens during lossy compression is the actual overall number of pixels could be reduced. Now, when you're using certain software, you can actually choose how much compression you want to apply to an image when you are saving it or a different file. So if you're gonna heavily compress it, it's gonna really reduce the file size by a lot. However, the more you compress an image, it's gonna look less and less like the original, but it will have a smaller file size because overall you've got less pixels and colors available. So obviously it comes with some advantages, having a smaller file size and using lossy compression, you can store more files. And the, often the images which are compressed like this, like a JPEG, are compatible with most software. So you can open it on pretty much piece of, any piece of software you've got on your computer. And with the small file size, it means that it can also be downloaded really quickly. As mentioned though, it does come with some disadvantages as well. So once the data has been removed, it is actually gone permanently. So if you reduce the amount of pixels, you can't get those back and it will have lower quality overall. And lossy compression can't actually be applied to a text file. Now that seems like a, a weird point to make, but in the past it's asked in an exam, which would be the most appropriate type of compression to use on a text file and you wouldn't have been able to choose lossy compression as your answer because if lossy compression was applied to a text file, it would actually be missing information from that text file. So if you are asked a question like that in your exam, you cannot apply lossy compression to text files. So the other type of compression we've got is lossless compression. Now this is kind of similar to my analogy before about the can of Coke. So lossless compression temporarily removes data from a file and then restores it when it's opened. So it's a bit like if you can think of it crushing down and then if you need it, you then open it again. That's like lossless compression. Now the way it does this is by remembering the information from the file in a bit of a different way. So it will follow an algorithm so it knows what information is stored about that file. So if we were talking about an image file such as a PNG, that's an example of lossless compression. Now if the next 50 pixels were all red, rather than saying, red pixel, red pixel, red pixel, red pixel. It would just say 50 red pixels, which is gonna reduce the number of binary information that's needed to store that image file. But then when it comes to actually recreating that image, if it was suddenly in use, it would know exactly what information to include in that image because all of the information is right there. It's just stored in a bit of a different way because of the algorithm. And the proper name for that method is called run length encoding, but you don't really need to know that for your exam. All you need to know is that it temporarily removes the data and then it will restore it when the file is in use and it's been opened. Again, it comes with some advantages and disadvantages. So the biggest advantage is that there's no reduction in quality it will look or sound as true to the original as possible. You can use it on text files and obviously it can be decompressed back to its original form. Disadvantages, it will reduce the file size, but nowhere near as much as lossy compression will reduce the file size and they will take longer to download because they've got that larger file size. Okay, so some exam questions to practice on this topic. So Mr. Moore wants to compress a text file which type of compression is the most appropriate? Justify your answer. Explain why Mr. Moore might want to compress his audio files. And finally, explain why lossy compression is suitable for a video clip, but it is not suitable for a text document. So as always, give them a go before checking back on your notes or on this video. And if you're not quite sure, obviously rewatch the video or check back on your notes. That's it for this session. See you next time.